nurse bearing the body of Franklin Delano Roosevelt rolls past patients at the Warm Springs Infantile Paralysis Foundation. Leaving the little White House forever, the late Commander-in-Chief is born on his last journey to the nation's capital. The 11-car presidential train departs from the Warm Springs Railroad Station. It moves slowly, taking 23 hours for the trip to Washington. Sorrowing throngs line the tracks. Arriving at Union Station, the train is met by Brigadier General Elliot Roosevelt and other members of the family. Also President Truman, Commerce Secretary Wallace, War Secretary Stimson, Admiral King and General Marshall. The flag-draped coffin carried on a black caisson drawn by white horses begins the mournful trip to the White House. The cortege moves past hushed crowds while a flight of army bombers passes overhead. All branches of the service are represented in the mile-long procession. Five hundred thousand people view the final march. Flanked by the military honor guard, the presidential cortege moves toward the main entrance of the White House. A private funeral service will be held before the president's body is once more placed aboard the train for the trip to the Hyde Park burial grounds. The casket lies in the White House East Room where 80 years ago Abraham Lincoln's body lay in state. Hyde Park. In the garden of the Roosevelt Estate, West Pointers form the honor guard as last rites are performed. U.S. destroyers shell Jap positions on Caballo, Philippine Islands, as troops of the 2nd Battalion, 51st Regiment, 38th Division, invade the tiny island just off the south coast of Corregidor. 155mm howitzers based on nearby Bataan lay down a protective barrage of white phosphorus to screen landing operations. B-25s and p 51 strafe and bomb the island. Caballo hillsides are thoroughly pounded. Preliminary shelling clears the beach of enemy opposition and our troops encounter little Jap resistance as they spread out over the heavily mined beach. Elements of the 38th Division moving inland over the rough hill country run into some sniper fire. The 
bazookas fire on Jap tunnel positions at hill number one. Destroying Japs entrenched in hillside caves. Our troops use demolition charges composed of 25 pounds of TNT in a bag with a 15 second fuse. Resulting explosions close all but the biggest caves, leaving the Japs inside to starve. Patrols attempt to rescue troops of E and F companies, 151st Regiment, stranded without water, food and ammunition on the top of a hillside. The rescue party tries to scale the 250-foot, 90-degree cliff with the aid of a guide rope, but crumbling rocks make it impossible for troops to climb the hillside. When the rope is secured to the top of the hill, supplies are hoisted to the stranded men. Initial attempts to pull up the water cans are unsuccessful, and additional men have to be placed on the hillside to lend a hand at pulling. Attempts are first made to lower the wounded by basket litter, but they are unsuccessful. The wounded are then forced to climb down alone and one at a time. Weak from their wounds and lack of water and food, the men drop exhausted on a shelf of the cliff and are helped down the rest of the way by medics. Several of the rescuing party are hurt when huge rocks are dislodged and roll down the hill. LCMs remove the wounded to LST hospital ships. Invasion of another Philippine island. Troops of the 3rd Battalion, 182nd Regiment, Americal Division, land at Talisai Point, Cebu. The attack follows a bombardment by cruisers and destroyers of the 7th Fleet. Opposition is moderate on the beach, although our troops are brought under small arms and mortar fire. Major General William H. Arnold, commander of the Americal Division, maps the drive on Cebu City, second largest in the Philippines. Mortars and other equipment are brought ashore. Troops quickly drive inland against disorganized enemy resistance. Elaborate tank traps and roadblocks are encountered along the highway leading from Talisai to Cebu City, five miles away. Landmines form part of the enemy's extensive coast defenses. These positions were abandoned by the enemy, whose garrison was weakened when troops were sent to fight at Leyte. A dead American killed by a mine. Our losses in the invasion were described as extremely light. 4.2 inch mortars are brought forward by men of the 80th Mortar Battalion. 90 minutes after hitting the beach, our tanks and troops had driven more than 800 yards inland. First organized enemy resistance is encountered on the outskirts of Pardo, a village two miles from Cebu City. With grenades and rifle fire, troops try to flush out Jap snipers hiding in a house. The house has set a fire to drive the enemy out into the open. Five of the six snipers in the house were killed while one was wounded. Quickly wiping out the remaining Jap resistance in palm groves, rice paddies and mangrove swamps, tanks and troops move on Pardo. Entering Pardo, our troops are greeted by Filipino civilians. Machine guns and ammunition are hauled to the front in native carts called tatarmillas. During the first day's fighting, 
88 Jap troops are killed and 16 taken prisoner. Our troops approach Cebu City. Retreating Japs filled the streets with mines and planted booby traps in homes and public buildings. Whole blocks were destroyed by demolition charges, but harbor facilities were undamaged. Fort San Pedro, an old military installation in the city. Capture of Cebu ends the Jap hold on all the central Philippines. Looking down on the beachhead established by 10th Army invasion forces on the southwest coast of Okinawa Island, in addition to the more than 1,500 Navy and Coast Guard warships which participated in the attack on the Japanese island, scores of cargo vessels are anchored offshore to supply our troops with needed materiel. Hundreds of small landing craft, alligators and ducks fly back and forth between the beach and ships carrying supplies. Hastily constructed causeways and newly built docks facilitate unloading operations. Troops, tanks and other equipment move inland over one of the island's main highways. Spearheads drive forward from the beachhead to cut the island in two. Marine units then push north while the 24th Army Corps strikes south toward the capital city of Naha, main center of Jap resistance. Repairing one of Okinawa's major airstrips pitted with bomb craters, both the important Yontan and Katena airfields were seized within a few hours after our landings. Much of Okinawa is intensively cultivated farming country. Infantry move up the road to destroy Jap emplacements. Main enemy opposition is centered in pillboxes and hillside caves. Natural hillside caves are fortified with machine guns or mortars. Troops must wipe out the pockets one by one. Many of these caves conceal Okinawa civilians who fled to the hills to escape naval bombardment of the coast. Our troops try to persuade the civilians to give themselves up. More than 400,000 Japanese are on Okinawa, and their presence in such large numbers adds to the difficulties of the island campaign. AMG officers go in with the troops to establish military government. Reassured that the Americans will not torture or kill them, hundreds of Okinawans voluntarily give themselves up and offer to cooperate with army authorities. The children quickly respond to good treatment and soon learn to ask for candy. A Japanese suicide rocket bomb used to attack our ships. The rocket bomb is 30 feet long and carries a one-man crew. It has the same type of fuselage as a standard model plane and an instrument panel is installed in the cockpit. Showing the rocket units on the rear. Removing the battery. The suicide pilot is sealed in the cockpit and navigates the bomb to its destruction. The tail rudder. The bomb is highly maneuverable in flight. The rocket carries a 2,500 pound explosive head in the nose. Although these suicide planes have done some damage, most are destroyed before they reach their targets. Navy films of fire on board the carrier USS Hancock. On 21st January, a TBM returning from a strike on Formosa landed on the flight deck while carrying several 500-pound bombs. 
As the plane taxied in, the bombs exploded. Fire immediately breaks out on the flight deck and spreads to the hangar deck below, burning planes and materiel. Firefighting crews use foam and water to bring the fire under control. In accordance with plans for fighting a deck fire, the ship is turned to starboard, thereby making an eight-degree list to port. This permits the men to work on the windward side of the fire and helps wash the burning gasoline over the side. The Hancock's planes landed on other carriers while the fire was being put out. Wounded personnel are removed to sick bay. Many of the crew, including doctors and medical corpsmen needed to care for the casualties, were temporarily trapped below deck. Ten minutes after the explosion, the flight deck fire is brought under control, and a few minutes later, the hangar fire is put out. Repair work starts 40 minutes after the accident. Steel plates are laid over the hole in the flight deck, and in one hour and 40 minutes, all emergency repairs are completed. The first plane lands on the repaired deck. Seven officers and 43 enlisted men lost their lives in the accident. Dust in the Irrawaddy Valley. British motorized units in Burma face serious mechanical difficulties coupled with the threat to security of vehicular movement. In addition, roads are breaking down under the constant heavy traffic. A solution to the problem is found through the use of elephant grass, which will be laid out to form a road matting. This constitutes one of the many improvisations applied by General Sir William Slim's 14th Army in its campaign through the difficult central Burma country. Terrain which suffers monsoon washouts and then excessive dryness poses challenging problems for road engineers. The bed of elephant grass minimizes the dust cloud, wards off ruts and other hindrances to safe and rapid passage of vehicles headed for the Burma front. OWI leaflets dropped in the forward areas tell the Burmese about Allied air power and contain instructions for using the printed sheets as soap. Especially impregnated for this purpose, the leaflet works up a satisfactory lather when dipped into water. This incident in psychological warfare occurs in March at Mietsan, Burma, about 75 miles southwest of Namkam. Demonstrating assembly of the M100, only Japanese manufactured submachine gun. Captured by the British at Miktila, it is a 30 round air cooled weapon weighing 10 pounds. This is probably the first appearance of the M100 in the Burma fighting. Previously, it had been reported in Manchuria and later was identified on Saipan. Replacing the stock, this gun is designed to take a bayonet. It fires 8 millimeter low pressure ammunition. Fitted with a bipod for prone firing, the M100 may also be used as a shoulder weapon. The Japanese 75 millimeter field gun 1930 model, first of its type to be captured. An unusual feature which so far has not been found on any other Jap artillery weapon is the muzzle brake. Elevation, 43 degrees. Traverse, 25 degrees. The 75 is characterized by a split trail. Ordnance sources state that the Japanese have surrounded this gun with a great deal of mystery since its introduction. Foreign military observers were unable to view it except at a distance during military reviews and maneuvers. A close-up study now reveals the complete firing mechanism. Muzzle velocity is 2,230 feet per second. Maximum range, 15,000 yards. Rate of fire, 10 to 12 rounds per minute. Air Corps films of 5,000 barrel storage tanks at Baoshan, China, near the Mekong River. 
They are on the route of the India-China pipeline carrying gas and oil from Calcutta to Gunming. Roughly paralleling the Stillwell Road, the pipeline is constructed of lightweight four and six inch coupled invasion pipe. Where necessary, heavier welded pipe is used. Digging a ditch line. The work is done by native labor under supervision of army engineers. Pumping stations installed along the line are evenly spaced in accordance with hydraulic principles. And here the pipe is suspended over the Mekong River. To span the Salween River, the engineers find it necessary to construct a bridge which will support the pipe. The 780th Engineer Petroleum Distribution Company constructs the suspension bridge which will be 750 feet long and 4 feet wide. The cables are winched across and anchored, initiating one of the outstanding feats of pipeline operations which General Sultan already has labeled as a monument to American engineering. After both cables are strung across satisfactorily, the pendants are prepared for affixing the prefabricated boardwalk sections. These sections, in 20 by 4 foot lengths, consist of 4 inch pipe emplaced as support for the wood flooring. Welding one of the saddles which will retain the fuel pipeline. The boards are secured to the pipe frame by strands of wire. Completed sections of the walk will be bolted to the pendants and then pulled out over the river between the suspension cables. Finally, the pipeline itself is strung across the new Salween River Bridge. The welding crews also have put in an expansion loop at the bridge approach to compensate for contracting and expanding of the pipeline under diverse weather conditions. In Washington, before a joint session of Congress attended by the Cabinet, Supreme Court Justices, and foreign representatives, Mr. Truman delivers his first address as president. Only yesterday, we laid to rest the mortal remains of our beloved president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Tragic fate has thrust upon us grave responsibilities. We must carry on. So that there can be no possible misunderstanding, both Germany and Japan can be certain beyond any shadow of a doubt that America will continue the fight for freedom until no vestige of resistance remains. Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. The grand strategy of the United Nations war has been determined, due in no small measure to the vision of our departed Commander-in-Chief. We are now carrying out our part of that strategy under the able direction of Admiral Leahy, General Marshall, Admiral King, General Arnold, General Eisenhower, Admiral Nimitz, and General MacArthur. I want the entire world to know that this direction must and will remain unchanged and unhampered. Within an hour after I took the oath of office, I announced that the San Francisco conference would proceed. <laughs> we will face the problems of peace with the same courage that we have faced and mastered the problems of war. In the memory of those who have made the supreme sacrifice, in the memory of our fallen president, we shall not fail. At this moment, I have in my heart a prayer. As I have assumed my heavy duties, I humbly pray, Almighty God, in the words of King Solomon, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart 
to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great people? I ask only to be a good and faithful servant of my Lord and my people.